First of which is from Bob Chen, who is director of CSIN. Um, and you're going to have to unpack that, that particular acronym for me because I can't, I can't remember. Ah, okay, the Centre for International Earth Science Information Network. Thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks, Simon. And uh, I'm really here partly uh, wearing the hat as manager of this NASA Such Economic Data and Application Center, which is a World Data System element now. And my co author is uh, uh, the deputy manager, Alex Sherbinen, who's also a new member of the World Data System Scientific Committee. Uh, and I, I want to talk about uh, this issue of integration of social uh, and natural science data. Uh, in support of interdisciplinary research and applications. So obviously the first question is why, and uh, there are lots of reasons out there. I just picked the uh, Belmont Challenge uh, as an example, which talks about uh, delivering knowledge needed for action, for avoiding and adapting to detrimental environmental change, um, and specifically uh, says that this requires a bunch of things, risks, impacts, vulnerabilities, which have both social and natural science components, and, and calls out the interaction of natural and social sciences uh, at the beginning. Uh, so probably should have written emphasis added. Um, so, uh, but you know, there are lots of other uh, statements like these and, and recognition in the community of this need to put data together from a range of disciplines uh, covering uh, natural, social, and really, as we heard earlier, health sciences, uh, engineering, and other other disciplines that don't often, um, don't always collaborate or know how to talk to each other. Uh, but I'm lucky, I was part of a network uh, that more than 20 years ago recognized the need for what we call human dimensions data. And so when they present a list of all the data coming from their satellites, they actually also have this little term called human dimensions and list a few of the areas that, that they found relevant. And they implement it through uh, this network of data centers that I'm uh, part of. Something you may have seen are, are gridded population data is very uh, widely used, it's been around a long time. But also environmental indicators, uh, data produced by the community that is integrated, such as uh, land use classifications and others. Uh, we've been working on uh, making accessible uh, uh, human infrastructure data on roads, we're part, we co-lead a uh, uh, co-data roads, open roads, data access pass group. Local roads. roads data development. Thank you, Simon. We work together. <laughs> I, I used to be Secretary General of Co-data before he was, so we, we, we've interacted a lot. Um, but reservoirs and dams, nuclear power plants, other human infrastructure, uh, we actually also dabble a little bit in air quality uh, using some of the NASA instruments. Um, and we're, we have open web services. We're, we're active in the Open Geospatial Consortium and others and, and produce uh, not just um, web access service, but also uh, some web processing services to enable spatial queries uh, through distributed services. Um, so I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about some of these as I go along. but. Since the point is uh, talking about data integration, just want to throw out that um, you can do that in a number of ways. You can actually internally take data and put it together uh, within the data center and make that available. You can support the user community in their efforts to do integration. Um, and you can do that through uh, a number of ways. Uh, but uh, uh, one is to obviously make the data available, but also to provide tools and services that uh, enable integration, uh, especially in, uh, you know, not just in a research project, but in simulation models, in decision support tools. And, and of course, a lot of data use happens in this kind of gray literature um, in, the, in the application area and decision support area it occurs in this kind of policy literature uh, uses. and. Uh, so we, we uh, think about all these ways of doing data integration and just uh, some of the things that uh, come out of it are, for example, we do a number of policy relevant indicator activities, uh, something called the Environmental Performance Index. I'll actually be talking about uh, our indicator work in the session on Wednesday, uh, but uh, I won't go into it today. Some of the other products, uh, again, we've taken 
uh, products that the community has developed and normally would just sit there on some researcher's uh, website, you know, for a couple of years before they moved on or got updated. So we've uh, acquired and, uh, you know, done better documentation and made a bit the data available to the community that might be valuable for other people to use. Uh, and we've done a number of our own uh, data integration efforts, for example, uh, looking at the low elevation coastal zone, uh, create, we have a product called PLACE, which is uh, taking the spatial analysis, but then aggregating it up to the national level, because there are a lot of users out there, economists and others, who really don't have GIS capability, but they want, the, at the national level, a product that tells them about some national distribution within a country of intersected variables. Um, uh, so there are lots of examples like that. Uh, and one that actually relates to uh, the previous talk is, is uh, for example, you may be interested in air quality patterns, and, as we saw, but air quality is really relevant where people live, not where it's in the middle of a desert or whatever, for policy purposes. So, you know, a simple weighting of population um, uh, of, of um, things like particulate matter concentration by population can be valuable. Um, this was part of, partly the basis for some of the debate that you saw in the news about, you know, New Delhi being um, as polluted as uh, Beijing, um, which uh, when we had the come data meeting, luckily wasn't as bad, but um, so these are, uh, you know, different types of data integration applications you might think of. One is obviously, you know, how does uh, an exposure to a hazard or, or a climate change or whatever uh, uh, affect people? Um, how are they vulnerable? What are, what are their characteristics of vulnerability? How are they drivers of, of uh, land use and other kinds of change? Uh, when you're doing analysis, uh, do you want to analyze uh, places where people are, or do you want to uh, uh, mask out those areas because uh, people tend to mess up, you know, other phenomena you might, might be trying to uh, analyze. Um, and you see in the literature, we've done a number of studies uh, kind of examining how our data is used in the literature. Uh, you see everything from, uh, you know, simple uh, statistical analysis using uh, both social and natural science variables. You see um, integration sort of at the, at the tail end, um, uh, what, what I often call research translation. So this bottom left was a paper in Nature that talked all about using grace measurements to assess uh, ground uh, water and, and underwater aquifers. At the end, they said, well, you know, it, it, what's important from a policy viewpoint, it, you know, wasn't part of the science of understanding the distribution using remote sensing, but at the end, to make it policy relevant, they said, well, here's where this water is relative to population. So that's kind of translating uh, basic research into something that's policy relevant. The top example, though, is more, uh, uh, this is Karen Sito's work uh, doing modeling of urban expansion, you know, using the data as an integral part of, of the model. So you can think of these different uh, levels and, and types of uses of socioeconomic data in integration and, and try to optimize and, and support all those different kinds of functions. Um, just a little quick, we, as, as I mentioned, we support open web processing services. Uh, we've had a, a population estimation service that lets you just draw full polygon, um, estimate, uh, you know, when a typhoon, in this case, I think it's Haiyan, travels across, how many people are exposed, and we've been expanding uh, in terms of the supporting integration, uh, kind of the interfaces that allow you to do uh, slightly more sophisticated um, estimates with uh, different layers coming from both the natural social science sides of wildfires or, or um, coastal hazards or locations of nuclear power plants and, and dams and reservoirs. Um, and we're actually also uh, working on an iOS application to kind of make this uh, add the geolocation component that you get with a mobile app. So, um, Clearly, there are a lot of barriers to integration. Most people focus on the scientific and technical ones, of which there are many. Um, I won't go into it in detail. You can read it. But you know, equally important is the institutional and cultural. I mean, the, the scientific barriers. Uh, 
you know, working across the natural and social sciences, there's just a lot of different uh, issues uh, regarding how they even think about um, their their science and their units of analysis and, and how you know people versus environmental systems behave in space and time uh, and how you put that together. Uh, as was mentioned before, there's a whole set of privacy and confidentiality and other issues related to socioeconomic data. Um, uh, uh, as came up uh, earlier, legal interoperability of the data is also a big issue and, and there is a Co-data, Research Data Alliance, uh, Legal Interoperability Interest Group that, that I can chair, uh, which is trying to address some of those issues. And, and really also just some different uh, ways of managing data in the, in the science community that are pretty um, interesting and sometimes difficult to, to, to deal with in terms of promoting integration. Um, so one effort I, I was going to mention is uh, and Mark had brought up the Belmont Forum. There was a year and a half project, uh, which has the report that just came out June 30th. And uh, 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 you can download it very long link, but I'm sure you can search for it. But uh, one thing it did talk about is uh, the need to, uh, you know, following up on the Belmont Challenge, how you might uh, integrate data across the natural, social, health, and engineering domains to get at uh, some of these issues and uh, uh, not only support the science, but also uh, applications and decision making. And within that was a uh, proposal or an example of a proposed workshop that would actually um, uh, try to get at the very specific natural science, natural social science issue, uh, picking up on the fact that actually the Belmont Forum and other projects and, and also with the future Earth coming about, there actually is experience in doing interdisciplinary projects, international interdisciplinary projects. And those, there's two parts of that experience. One is those projects probably have to take social and natural science data and put it together. And secondly, they may have produced integrated products. And I think one of the big issues is where does that data end up, right? The, a social, nat, social science data archive or a natural science data archive may not be equipped to take the output because they only know one piece of it. And so does it fall between the cracks? Is it managed badly because only one group does it? Or are there some interdisciplinary archives like mine or, or Swedish, uh, uh, Swedish uh, yours, uh, uh, you know, have the capability to support that kind of interdisciplinary data management? Um, uh, I put in a plug for uh, RDA, which is having a uh, plenary this September, uh, and will focus on climate data. And uh, uh, the three organizations uh, are planning an international data week, uh, hopefully in the DC era in September uh, 2016. Um, one final thought, uh, remember putting the data together, integrating it well is only the first step. Um, you uh, still have to get people to use it and think about how. So, uh, you know, it's great if we do it, but um, we have to get the community to uh, think about it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, do we have Mark and Kermak? Okay. okay. It's a time for. Or does anyone have a, a quick question while Marco is setting up his presentation? Is your presentation on the yeah. machine? Can I just ask the question about uncertainties? When you have these derived products, we see the maps, you've got numbers on them, and then the dumb user kind of pulls it out and uses it. How do you see us moving forward in terms of encapsulating uncertainties in those derived products? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, I think that's something we. Uh, struggle with, uh, particularly the geospatial community sometimes, and, and having maps that look a lot more uh, accurate than they really are. Uh, in fact, we hosted a IPCC working group uh, last week, and, and you know that whole the whole issue that was raised before about downscaling and the, and and how you use that data is very valuable data, but it's not a prediction of, of some some. Uh, pixel scale uh, behavior. Uh, so um, no, I think that's a, that's a, a big problem. In, in some of our gridded population products, we've been trying to
put out uncertainty estimates for uh, the population distribution. I think that's a whole area that is needed to really understand how to put uh, data that has both spatial and uh, spatial variability, temporal averaging, and other other things that mix in, especially the model data of the scenarios, and how you capture that into things that are uh, useful. Uh, you know, and, and science criteria for uncertainty and understanding can be different from the application case, uh, as you know, another layer. Okay, thank you both.